All right. I got a little excited yesterday um, when I read that declaration. I got really into it. And when my roommate walked in and screamed, totally freaked me out. So <laughs> that was pretty funny. I don't get scared very easily. So that was, so it's, it's actually kind of enjoyable to go through that every once in a while. Just a little bit of panic. Grows a little hair on the chest. <clears throat> yeah, I just, I felt like I needed to read it because in the moment I was feeling pretty uh, euphoric toward that idea. Um, euphoric meaning just like aligned with this thinking about freedom and what the declaration meant to me the first time I read it. Um, is it did answer some questions and, uh, yeah, so, but man, that was, yeah, that was pretty funny. Anyway, um, I saw that the OpenStax website has the organic chemistry book on it. So I want to get through the chemistry soon. So that way I can start reading that one because chemistry is my main, was my main focus in college. And would probably be the easiest thing to kind of review over before kind of branching off into other things, um, like for realsies and not for kind of just the readings that I've been doing. So let's go ahead and read chapter nine of the chemistry book. And then if I'm feeling it, chapter 10, might need a break in between, but um, we'll just see. But yeah, chemistry, OpenStax chemistry, chapter nine. <clears throat> <clears throat> Chapter outline, 9-1, gas pressure, 2, relating pressure, volume, amount, and temperature, the ideal gas law, 3, stoichiometry of gaseous substances, mixtures, and reactions, 4, diffusion and diffusion of gases, 5, the kinetic molecular theory, and 6, non-ideal gas behavior. Introduction. We are surrounded by an ocean of gas, the atmosphere, and many of the properties of gases are familiar to us from our daily activities. Heated gases expand, which can make it a hot air balloon rise or cause a blowout in a bicycle tire left in the sun on a hot day. Gases have played an important part in the development of chemistry. In the 17th and 18th centuries, many scientists investigated gas behavior, providing the first mathematical descriptions of the behavior of matter. In this chapter, we will examine the relationships between gas temperature pressure, amount, and volume. We will study a simple theoretical model and use it to analyze the experimental behavior of gases. The results of these analyses will show us the limitations of the theory and how to improve on it. 9-1, gas pressure. By the end of this section, you will be able to define the property of pressure, define and convert among the units of pressure measurements, describe the operation of common tools for measuring gas pressure, Calculate pressure from a manometer data from manometer data. The Earth's atmosphere exerts a pressure, as does any other gas. Although we do not normally notice atmospheric pressure, we are sensitive to pressure changes. For example, when your ears pop during takeoff and landing while flying, or when you dive underwater. Gas pressure is caused by the force exerted by gas molecules colliding with the surfaces of objects. Although the force of each collision is very small, any surface of appreciable area experiences a large number of collisions in a short time, which can result in a high pressure. In fact, normal air pressure is strong enough to crush a metal container when not balanced by equal pressure from inside the container. Atmospheric pressure is caused by the weight of the column of air molecules in the atmosphere above an object, such as a tanker car. At sea level, this pressure is roughly the same as that exerted by a full-grown African elephant standing on a doormat or a typical bowling ball resting on your thumbnail. These may seem like huge amounts, and they are, but life on Earth has evolved under such atmospheric pressure. If you actually perch a bowling ball on your thumbnail, the pressure experienced is twice the usual pressure and the sensation is unpleasant. In general, pressure is defined as the force exerted on a given area, P equals F over A. 
So pressure equals force over area. Note that pressure is indirectly proportional <clears throat> or is directly proportional to force and inversely proportional to area. Thus, pressure can be increased either by increasing the amount of force or by decreasing the area over which it is applied. Pressure can be decreased by decreasing the force or increasing the area. <sighs> Let's apply this concept to determine which exerts a greater pressure in figure 9-3, the elephant or the figure skater. A large African elephant can weigh seven tons supported on four feet, each with a diameter of about one and a half feet. Foot, uh, so the pressure exerted by each foot is about 14 pounds inches. The figure skater weighs about 120 pounds supported on two skate blades, each with an area of about two inches squared. So the pressure exerted by each blade is about 30 pound inches squared. Oh, I didn't see the inches squared, sorry. 14 pound inches squared and 30 pound inches squared. Even though the elephant <clears throat> is more than 100 times heavier than the skater, it exerts less than one half of the pressure. On the other hand, if the skater removes their skates and stands with bare feet or regular footwear on the ice, the larger area over which their weight is applied greatly reduces the pressure exerted. So it goes down to two pound inch squared. The SI unit of pressure is the Pascal with one Pascal equals one Newton per meter squared, where the Newton is a unit of force defined at one kilogram meters per second squared. One Pascal is a small pressure. In many cases, it is more convenient to use units of, of kilopascal or bar, which is 100,000 Pascals. <clears throat> in the United States, pressure is often measured in pounds of force on an area of one square inch, <clears throat> pounds per square inch. For example, in car tires, pressure can also be measured using the unit atmosphere, which originally represents the average sea level air pressure at the approximate latitude of Paris. Table 9.1 provides some information on these and a few other common units for pressure measurements. We can measure atmospheric pressure, the force exerted by the atmosphere on the Earth's surface with a barometer. A barometer is a glass tube that is closed at one end, filled with a non-volatile liquid such as mercury, and then inverted and immersed in a container of that liquid. The atmosphere exerts pressure on the liquid outside of the tube. The column of liquid exerts pressure inside the tube, and the pressure at the liquid surface is the same inside and outside the tube. The height of the liquid in the tube is therefore <sighs> proportional to the pressure exerted by the atmosphere. If the liquid is water, normal atmospheric pressure will support a column of water over 10 meters high, which is rather inconvenient for making and reading a barometer. Because mercury is about 13.6 times denser than water, a mercury barometer only needs to be about 13.6 as tall as a water barometer, a more suitable size. Standard atmospheric pressure of one atmosphere at sea level corresponds to a column of mercury that is about 760 millimeters high. The tor was exactly intended, originally intended, to be a unit equal to one millimeter of mercury, but it no longer corresponds exactly. The pressure exerted by a fluid due to gravity is known as hydrostatic pressure, P, where P equals H rho G, where H is the height of the fluid, rho is the density of the fluid, and G is the acceleration due to gravity. <clears throat> A manometer is a device similar to a barometer that can be used to measure the pressure of a gas trapped in a container. A closed-ended manometer is a U-shaped tube with one, ar one closed arm, one arm that connects to the gas to be measured, and a non-volatile liquid in between. As with a barometer, the distance between the liquid levels in, a, in the two arms of the tube is proportional to the pressure of the gas in the container. An open-ended manometer... Ooh. <clears throat> is the same as a closed end closed end manometer, but one of its arms is open to the atmosphere. In this case, the distance between the liquid levels corresponds to the difference in pressure between the gas in the container and the atmosphere. Oops, too far.
All right, 9.2. Relating pressure, volume, amount, and temperature. The ideal gas law. I need this. All right. Identify the mathematical relationships between the various properties of gases. Use the ideal gas law and related gas laws to compute the values of various gas properties under specified conditions. During the 17th and especially 18th centuries, driven by both a desire to understand nature and a quest to make balloons in which they could fly, a number of scientists established the relationships between the macroscopic physical properties of gases, that is, pressure, volume, temperature, and amount of gas. Although their measurements were not precise by today's standards, they were able to determine the mathematical relationships between pairs of these variables that hold for an ideal gas, a hypothetical construct that real gases approximate under certain conditions. Eventually, these individual laws were combined into a single equation, the ideal gas law, that relates gas quantities for gases and is quite accurate for low pressures and moderate temperatures. We will consider the key developments in individual relationships uh, for pedagogical reasons, pedagogical reasons, pedag yeah, uh, not quite in historical order, then put them together in the ideal gas law. Pressure and temperature, Edmonton's law. Imagine filling a rigid container attached to a pressure gauge with a gas and then sealing the container so that no gas may escape. If the, gas can, if the container is cooled, the gas inside likewise gets colder and its pressure is observed to decrease. Since the container is rigid and tightly sealed, both the volume and number of moles of gas remain constant. If we heat the sphere, the gas inside gets hotter and the pressure increases. This relationship between temperature and pressure is observed for any sample of gas confined to a constant volume. An example of experimental pressure temperature data is shown for a sample of air under these conditions. We find that temperature and pressure are linear, linearly related, and if the temperature is on the Kelvin scale, then P and T are directly proportional. If the temperature on the Kelvin scale increases by a certain factor, the gas pressure increases by the same factor. Guillaume Amentons was the first to empirically establish the relationship between the pressure and the temperature of a gas and Joseph Louis Gay Lussac determined the relationship more precisely. Because of this, the PT relationship for gases is known as either Edmonton's law or Gay Lussac's law. Under either name, it states that the pressure of a given amount of gas is directly proportional to its temperature on the Kelvin scale when the volume is held constant. Mathematically, this can be written as P proportional to T or P equals constant times T or P equals KT, where the proportional symbol means is proportional to, and K is a proportionality constant that depends on the identity, amount, and volume of the gas. For a confined constant volume of gas, the ratio P over T is therefore constant, where P over T equals K. If the gas is initially in condition one, with P equals P1 and T equals T1, and then changes to condition two with P equals P2 and T equals T2, then we have P1 over T1 equals K and P2 over T2 equals K, which reduces to P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. This equation is useful for pressure temperature calculations for a confined gas at constant volume. Note that temperatures must be on the Kelvin scale for any gas law calculations zero on the Kelvin scale and the lowest possible temperature is called absolute zero. Also note that there are at least three ways we can describe how the pressure of a gas changes as its temperature changes. We can use a, value, a table of values, a graph, or a mathematical equation. Volume and temperature, Charles's law. If we fill a balloon with air and seal it, the balloon contains a specific amount of air at atmospheric pressure, let's say one atmosphere. If we put the balloon in a refrigerator, the gas inside gets cold and the balloon shrinks. Although both the amount of gas and its pressure remain constant, if we make the balloon very cold, it will shrink a great deal and it expands again when it warms up. <clears throat> These examples of the effect of temperature on the volume of a given amount of a combined gas at constant temperature are true in general. The volume increases, 
as the temperature increases and decreases as the temperature decreases. Volume temperature data for a one mole sample of methane gas at one atmosphere are listed and graphed in figure 912. The relationship between the volume and temperature of a given amount of gas at constant pressure is known as Charles's law in recognition of the French scientist and balloon flight pioneer Jacques uh, Alexander Caesar Charles. Charles's law states that the volume of a given amount of gas is directly proportional to its temperature on the Kelvin scale when the pressure is held constant. Mathematically, this can be written as V proportional T or V equals constant times T or V equals KT or V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, with K being a proportionality constant that depends on the amount and pressure of the gas. For a confined constant pressure gas sample, V over T is constant. And as seen with the P-T relationship, this leads to another form of Charles's law, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Volume and pressure, Boyle's law. If we partially fill an airtight syringe with air, the syringe contains a specific amount of air at constant temperature, say 25 Celsius. If we push, slowly push in the plunger while keeping temperature constant, the gas in the syringe is compressed into a smaller volume and its pressure increases. If we pull out the plunger, the volume increases and the pressure decreases. This example of the effect of volume on the pressure of a given amount of a confined gas is true in general. Decreasing the volume of a contained gas will increase the, its pressure and increasing its volume will decrease its pressure. In fact, if the volume increases by a certain factor, the pressure decreases by the same factor and vice versa. Volume pressure data for an air sample at room temperature are graphed in figure 913. Whoa. <clears throat> Unlike the PT and VT relationships, pressure and volume are not directly proportional to each other. Instead, P and V exhibit inverse proportionality. Increasing the pressure results in a decrease of the volume of the gas. Mathematically, this can be written as P proportional 1 over V or P equals K times 1 over V or PV equals K or P1V1 equals P2V2 with K being a constant. Graphically, this relationship is shown by a straight line that results when plotting the inverse of the pressure versus the volume or the inverse of the volume versus the pressure. <clears throat> <clears throat> graphs with curved lines are difficult to read accurately at low or high values of the variables and they are more difficult to use in fitting theoretical equations and parameters to experimental data for those reasons scientists often try to find a way to linearize their data if you plot p versus b we obtain a hyperbola yep the relationship between the volume and pressure of a given amount of gas at a constant temperature was first published by the English natural philosopher Robert Boyle over 300 years ago. It is summarized in the statement now known as Boyle's Law. The volume of a given amount of gas held at constant temperature is inversely proportional to the pressure under which it is measured. Cool. Moles of gas and volume, Avogadro's Law. The Italian scientist Amadeo Avogadro advanced a hypothesis in 1811 to account for the behavior of gases, stating that equal volumes of all gases measured under the same conditions of temperature and pressure contain the same number of molecules. Over time, this relationship was supported by many experimental observations as expressed by Avogadro's law. For a confined gas, the volume V and number of moles N are directly proportional if the pressure and temperature both remain constant. In equation form, this is written as V proportional to N or V equals KN or V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. Mathematical relationships can also be determined for the other variable pairs, such as P versus N and N versus T. The ideal gas law. To this point, four separate laws have been discussed that relate pressure, volume, temperature, and the number of moles of the gas. Boyle's law, PV, constant, at, constant T and N. Edmonton's law, P over T, equals constant at constant V and N. Charles's law, V over T, constant at constant P and N, and then Avogadro's law, V over N, which is equal to constant at constant P and T. Combining these four laws yields the ideal gas law, a relationship between the pre pressure, volume, temperature, and number of moles of gas, PV equals NRT. Where P is the pressure of a gas, V is its volume, N is the number of moles of the gas, 
T is its temperature on the Kelvin scale, and R is a constant called, called the ideal gas constant or the universal gas constant. The units used to express pressure, volume, and temperature will determine the proper form of the gas constant as required by dimensional analysis. The most commonly encountered values being 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin and 8.314 kilopascal liter per mole Kelvin. Gases whose properties of PV and T are accurately described by the ideal gas law are said to exhibit ideal behavior or to approximate the traits of an ideal gas. An ideal gas is a hypothetical construct that may be used along with kinetic molecular theory to effectively explain the gas laws as will be <clears throat> described in a later model of this chapter. Although all the calculations presented in this module assume ideal behavior, this assumption is only reasonable for gases under conditions of relatively low pressure and high temperature. In the final module of this chapter, a modified gas law will be introduced that accounts for the non-ideal behavior observed for many gases at relatively high pressures and low temperatures. The ideal gas equation contains five terms, the gas constant R and the variable properties P, V, N, and T. Specifying any four of these terms will permit the use of the ideal gas law to calculate the fifth term as demonstrated in the following example exercises. Standard conditions of temperature and pressure. We have seen that the volume of a given quantity, quantity of gas and the number of molecules in a given volume of gas vary with changes in temperature and pressure. Chemists sometimes make comparisons against the standard temperature and pressure for reporting properties of gases, 273.15 Kelvin and one atmosphere. An SDP, one mole of an ideal gas, has the volume of about 22.4 liters. This is referred to as the standard molar volume. 9.3, stoichiometry of gaseous substances, mixtures, and reactions. By the end of the section, you'll be able to use the ideal gas law to compute gas densities and molar masses, perform stoichiometric calculations involving gaseous substances, state Dalton's law of partial pressures, and use it in calculations involving gaseous mixtures. The study of the chemical behavior of gases was part of the basis of perhaps the most fundamental chemical revolution in history. Reg Nobleman, Antoine Lavoisier, widely regarded as the father of modern chemistry, changed chemistry from a qualitative to a quantitative science through his work with gases. He discovered the law of conservation of matter, discovered the role of oxygen in combustion reactions, determined the composition of air, explained respiration in terms of chemical reactions, and more. He was a casualty of the French Revolution, guillotined in 1794. Of his death, mathematician and astronomer Joseph Louis Lagrange said, It took the mob only a moment to remove his head. A century will not suffice to reproduce it. Much of the knowledge we do have about Lavoisier's contributions is due to his, his wife, Marie-Anne Paulze Lavoisier, who worked with him in his lab. A trained artist fluent in several languages, he created detailed illustrations of the equipment in his lab and translated texts from foreign scientists to complement his knowledge. After his execution, she was instrumental in publishing Lavoisier's major treaty, treatise, which unified many concepts of chemistry and laid the groundwork for significant further study. As described in an earlier chapter of this text, we can turn to chemical stoichiometry for answers to many of the questions that ask how much. The essential property involved in such use of stoichiometry is the amount of substance typically measured in moles, for gases, molar amounts can be derived from convenient experimental measurements of pressure, temperature, and volume. Therefore, these measurements are useful in assessing the stoichiometry of pure gases, gas mixtures, and chemical reactions involving gases. This section will not introduce any new materials or ideas, but will provide examples of applications and ways to integrate concepts already discussed. Gas density and molar gas. The ideal gas law described previously in this chapter relates the properties of pressure, volume, temperature, and molar amount. This law is universal, relating these properties in identical fashion, regardless of the chemical identity of the gas, PV equals NRT. The density of a gas, on the other hand, is determined by its identity. As described in another chapter of this text, 
The density of a substance is its characteristic property that may be used to identify the substance, where D equals M over V. Rearranging the ideal gas equation to isolate V and substituting into the density equation yields D equals MP over NRT, or M over N times P over RT. The ratio M over M, N, is the definition of molar mass, cap M. The density equation can then be written D equals cap M P over RT. This relationship may be used for calculating the densities of gases of known identities at specified values of pressure and temperature as demonstrated in, in example 911. When the identity of a gas is unknown, measurements of the mass, pressure, volume, and temperature of a sample can be used to calculate the molar mass of the gas. Combining the ideal gas equation, PV equals NRT, and the definition of molar mass, cap M equals M over N, yields the following equation. Cap M equals little m RT over P -P PV. Determining the molar mass of a gas via this approach is the demonstrated in example 912. The pressure of a mixture of gases is Dalton's law. Unless they chemically react with each other, the individual gases in a mixture of gases do not affect each other's pressure. Each individual gas of a mixture exerts the same pressure that it would exert if it were present alone in the container. The pressure exerted by each individual gas is a in a mixture is called its partial pressure. This observation is summarized by Dalton's law of partial pressures. The total pressure of a mixture of ideal gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of the component gases. So P total equals PA plus PB plus PC dot 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 equals the sum of PI where it's just all the pressures available. In the equation, P total is the total pressure of the mix, mixture of gases. PA is the partial pressure of gas A. PB is the partial pressure of gas B. PC is the partial pressure of gas C, and so on. The partial pressure of gas A is related to the total pressure of the gas mixture via its mole fraction, a unit of concentration defined by the number of moles of a component of the solution divided by the total number of moles of all components. So PA equals XA plus P total, where XA equals the moles of A over the total moles, where PA, XA, and NA are the partial pressure mole fraction, a number of moles of gas A, respectively, and N total is the number of moles of all components in the mixture. All right, I gotta lay down for a minute. All right, I'm back, but I'm gonna give it a few minutes to wake up. I just took a nap. Um, I got hit pretty hard when I was after the sandwiches, but um, yeah, give me a few minutes. All right, let's go back to this. Collection of gases over water. A simple way to collect gases that do not react with water is to capture them inside a box or in a bottle that has been filled with water and inverted into a dish filled with water. The pressure of the gas inside the bottle can be made equal to the air pressure outside by raising or lowering the bottle. When the water level is the same, both inside and outside the bottle, the pressure of the gas is equal to the atmospheric pressure, which can be measured with a barometer. That's pretty cool. Oh yeah, I've done that before. Not with, a, <coughs> not with an Erlenmeyer like it's shown in there, but I guess that's not, I don't know if that's an Erlenmeyer because it doesn't have the markings on it. It's just a little beaker, I guess. Interesting. Someone sent me a texty.
Oh, sorry. Totally just like got really into that text. I <laughs> totally forgot that it was recording. Um, all right, let's go back down to this. However, there is another factor we must consider when we measure the pressure of the gas by this method. Water evaporates and there is always gaseous water above a sample of liquid water. As the gas is collected over water, it becomes saturated with water vapor and the total pressure of the mixture equals the partial pressure of the gas plus the partial pressure of the water vapor. The pressure of the pure gas is therefore equal to the total pressure minus the pressure of the water vapor. This is referred to as the dry gas pressure, that is, oh, excuse me, the pressure of the gas only without water vapor. The vapor pressure of water, which is the pressure exerted by water vapor in equilibrium with liquid water in a closed container, depends on the temperature. More detailed information on the temperature dependence of water vapor can be found in Table 9-2. And vapor pressure will be discussed in more detail in the next chapter on liquids. Chemical stoichiometry and gases. Chemical stoichiometry describes the quantitative relationships between reactants and products and chemical reactions. We have previously measured quantities of reactants and products using masses for solids and volumes in conjunction with the molarity for solutions. Now we can also use gas volumes to indicate quantities. If we know the volume, pressure, and temperature of a gas, we can use the ideal gas equation to calculate how many moles of the gas are present. If we know how many moles of the gas are involved, we can calculate the volume of a gas at any temperature and pressure. Avogadro's Law Revisited Sometimes we can take advantage of a simplifying feature of the stoichiometry of gases that solids and solutions do not exhibit. All gases that show ideal behavior contain the same number of molecules in the same volume at the same temperature and pressure. Thus, the ratios of volumes of gases involved in the chemical reaction are given by the coefficients of the equation for the reaction, provided that the gas volumes are measured at the same temperature and pressure. We can extend Avogadro's law that the volume of a gas is directly proportional to the number of moles of the gas to chemical reactions with gases. Gases combine or react in definite and simple proportions by volume, provided that all gas volumes are measured at the same temperature and pressure. For example, since nitrogen and hydrogen gases react to produce ammonia gas according to nitrogen plus three hydrogens equals two ammonia, a given volume of nitrogen gas reacts with three times that volume of hydrogen gas to produce two times that the volume of ammonia gas, if pressure and temperature remain constant. The explanation for this is illustrated in figure 923. According to Avogadro's law, equal volumes of gaseous N2, H2, and NH3 at the same temperature and pressure contain the same number of molecules. Because one molecule of N2 reacts with three molecules of H2 to produce two molecules of NH3, the volume of H2 required is three times the volume of N2, and the volume of NH3 produced is two times the volume of N2. Nine four, a fusion and diffusion of gases. By the end of this section, you will be able to define and explain a fusion and diffusion, state Graham's law, and use it to compute relevant gas properties. So, I just had an interesting thought about quantum. Well, it has the same prefix as quantity. So quant, to me, it just sounds like count. And so that's the thing with the periodic table. It just kind of goes the opposite of, it's, it's, it's counting, but it's just simple addition. You're just adding atoms together and each atom is essentially you could you can think of it not only as a letter but also as a number. Interesting. Okay, that's something I'm gonna have to look into later. Maybe I need to do that project of I, I really need to do that project of. Uh, oh, I could use uh, computer paper for it. So maybe that'll be my first 
uh, sorry to get off topic. Uh, that'll be my first um, document camera. But if, I don't know if I'm going to get a document camera. I'm going to try to use my cell phone uh, and this mount and see if I can make it work that way. Um, I think I can make it work. I think there's something there's something I can do. But I think what I'll do is I'll do that project where I uh, draw out the atoms in a certain way. I, I like that idea. So instead of seeing them as letters, seeing them as actual like geometric shapes and thinking of like a, like maybe have a proton be like a little circle or like a, yeah, like a, yeah, circle. And it'll be an open circle because it has a charge. And then a neutron will be a closed circle because it's basically filled in with, quote, the electron, oh, quote, oh, why did I say quote? It has an electron essentially in it based on the equations. So I'll just, I'll just think of it that way. And so you can think of the charge as filled. And so if it's, if the thing is filled, then it's, I'm just doing its own thing. All right. That's cool. Okay. By the end of the section, you'll be able to define and explain diffusion to fusion, state grams law, and use it to compute relevant gas properties. If you have ever been in a room when a piping hot pizza was delivered, you have been made aware of the fact that the gaseous molecules can quickly spread through a room as evidenced by the pleasant aroma that soon reaches your nose. Although gaseous molecules travel at tremendous speeds, hundreds of meters per second, they collide with other gaseous molecules and travel in many different directions before reaching the desired target. At room temperature, a gaseous molecule will experience billions of collisions per second. The mean free path is the average distance of a, a molecule travels between collisions. The mean free path increases with decreasing pressure. In general, the mean free path for a gaseous molecule will be hundreds of times the diameter of the molecule. <clears throat> In general, we know that when a sample gas is introduced to one part of a closed container, its molecules very quickly disperse throughout the container. This process by which molecules disperse in space in response to differences in concentration is called diffusion. The gaseous atoms or molecules, of course, un are, are of course unaware of any concentration gradient. They simply move randomly. Uh, regions of higher concentration have more particles than regions of lower concentrations. And so a net movement of species from high to low concentration areas take pla takes place in a closed environment. Uh, diffusion will ultimately result in equal concentrations of gas throughout as depicted in figure 927. The gaseous atoms and molecules continue to move, but since their concentrations are the same in both bulbs, the rates of transfer between the bulbs are equal. Oh, that's such a, that's freaking equilibrium right there that you could totally make equilibrium make so much more sense by just demonstrating this. You have particle A, particle B, and you open up the active or the energy barrier between the two and one will flow and then they'll start flowing into each other. That's so freaking cool. And then once they equalize, they reach a, a rate where the amounts in both containers just don't change, but we know that the atoms are still moving between the two. So that's so cool. All right. We are often interested in the rate of diffusion, the amount of gas passing through some area per unit time. Rate of diffusion equals amount of gas passing through an area over unit of time. The diffusion rate depends on several factors. The concentration gradient, the increase or decrease in concentration from one point to another. The amount of surface area available for diffusion and the distance the gas particles must travel. Note also the time required for diffusion to occur is inversely proportional to the rate of diffusion as shown in the rate of diffusion equation. A process involving movement of gaseous species similar to diffusion is effusion. The escape of gas molecules through a tiny hole, such as a pinhole in a balloon, into a vacuum. Although diffusion and effusion rates both depend on the molar mass of the gas involved, their rates are not equal. However, the ratios of their rates are the same. Graham's law of effusion, uh, the rate, oh, sorry. Uh, in a, if a mixture of gases is placed in a container with porous walls, the gas is effused through the small openings in the walls. The lighter gases pass through the small openings more rapidly than the heavier ones. 
1832, Thomas Graham studied the rates of effusion of different gases and formulated Graham's law of effusion. The rate of effusion of a gas is inversely proportional to the square root of the mass of its particles. Rate of effusion is proportional to one over the, the square root of that M or mu, maybe, maybe capital mu, I'm not sure. Uh, this means that if two gases, A and B, oh, mass, okay, so yeah, that's, that's an M. Uh, this means that if two gases, A and B, are at the same temperature and pressure, the ratio of their effusion rates is inversely proportional to the ratio of the square roots of the masses of their particles. Oh, I just thought of a really funny way of uh, expanding on science and some calculations. That'll be fun. I'll keep it to myself for now because it's the first time I've thought of it. Um, but if I think of it again, I'll talk about it. Actually, more like when. When I think about it again, I just got to hit, I got to reach something that, there we go, nine five, the kinetic molecular theory. Learning objectives, state the postulates of the kinetic molecular theory and use this theory's postulates to explain the gas laws. The gas laws that we have seen to this point, as well as the ideal gas equation are empirical. That is, they have been derived from experimental observations. Mathematical forms of these laws closely describe the macroscopic behavior of most gases at pressures less than about one or two atmospheres. <clears throat> Although the gas laws describe relationships that have been verified by many experiments, they do not tell us why gases follow these relationships. The, kinet the kinetic molecular theory is a simple microscopic model that effectively explains the gas laws described in previous modules of this chapter. This theory is based on the following five postulates described here. Note the term molecule will be used to refer to the individual chemical species that compose the gas, although some gases are composed of atomic species. For example, the noble gases. <clears throat> One, gases are composed of molecules that are in continuous motion, traveling in straight lines and changing direction only when they collide with other molecules or with the walls of a container. Two, the molecules composing the gas are negligibly small compared to the distances between them. The pressure exerted by, a, or sorry, three, the pressure exerted by a gas in a container results from collisions between the gas molecules and the container walls. Four, gas molecules exert no attractive or repulsive forces on each other or the container walls. Therefore, their collisions are elastic. Um, and five, the average kinetic energy of the gas molecules is proportional to the Kelvin temperature of the gas. The test of the KMT and its postulates is the, its ability to explain and describe the behavior of a gas. The various gas laws can be derived from the assumptions of the KMT, which have led ke chemists to believe that assumptions of the theory accurately represent the properties of gas molecules. We will first look at the individual gas laws, Boyle's, Charles, Amington's, Avogadro's, and Dalton's laws, conceptually to see how the KMT explains them. Then we will be more <clears throat> carefully we will more carefully consider the relationships between molecular masses, speeds, and kinetic energies with temperature, and explain Graham's law. Uh, the kinetic molecular theory explains the behavior of gases part one. Recalling that gas pressure is exerted by rapidly moving gas molecules and depends directly on the number of molecules hitting a unit area of the wall per unit of time. We see that the KMT conceptually explains the behavior of a gas as follows. Edmonton's law, if the temperature is increased, the average, kinet or average speed and kinetic energy of the gas molecules increase. If the volume is held constant, the, the increased speed of the gas molecules results in more frequent and more forceful collisions with the walls of the container, therefore increasing the pressure. Charles's law. <clears throat> if the temperature of a gas is increased, a constant pressure may be maintained only if the volume uh, occupied by the gas increases. This will result in greater average distances traveled by the molecules to reach the container walls, as well as increased wall uh, surface area these conditions will decrease both the frequency of molecule wall collisions and the number of collisions per unit area, the combined effects of which balance the effect of increased collision forces due to the greater kinetic energy at the higher temperature. Boyle's law. If the gas volume, or sorry, if the volume, sorry, gas volume, volume of a given amount of gas, 
Oh, it looks like they meant to type one of them. If the volume of a given amount of gas at a given temperature is decreased, that is, if the gas is compressed, the molecules will be exposed to a decreased container wall area. Collisions with the container wall will therefore occur more frequently, and the pressure exerted by the gas will increase. Avogadro's Law At constant pressure and temperature, the frequency and force of molecule wall collisions are constant. Under such collisions, increasing the number of gaseous molecules will require a proportional increase in the container volume in order to yield a decrease in the number of collisions per unit area to compensate for the increased frequency of collisions. Dalton's Law Because of the large distances between them, the molecules of one gas in a mixture bombard the container walls with the same frequency whether the gases are present or not and the total pressure of a gas mixture equals the sum of the partial pressures of the individual gases. Oh, molecular speeds and kinetic energy. The previous discussion showed that the KMT qualitatively explains the behaviors described by the various gas laws. The postulates of this theory may be applied in a more quantitative fashion to derive these individual laws. To do this, we must first look at speeds and kinetic energies of gas molecules and the temperature of a gas sample. In a gas sample, individual molecules have widely varying speeds. However, because of the vast number of molecules and collisions involved, the molecular speed distribution and average speed are constant. This molecular speed distribution is known as a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, and it depicts the relative numbers of molecules in a bulk sample of gas that possess a given speed. The kinetic energy of a particle of mass and speed is given by the kinetic energy equals one-half mu squared. Expressing mass in kilograms and speed in meters per second will yield energy values in units of joules. Uh, hold on one sec. Expressing mass in kilograms, yep. Uh, to deal with a large number of gas molecules, we use averages for both speed and kinetic energy. In the KMT, the root mean square speed of a particle, URMS, is defined as the square root of the average squares of the speeds with n equals the number of particles. And there's, there's that equation. The average kinetic energy for a mole of particles is then equal to that equation, where m is the molar mass uh, expressed in units of kilograms per mole. The kinetic energy average of a, a mole of gas molecules is also directly proportional to the temperature of the gas and may be described by the equation there, where R is the gas constant and T is the Kelvin temperature. When used in this equation, the appropriate form of the gas constant is that uh, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. These two separate equations for the kinetic energy average may be combined and rearranged to yield a relation between the molecular speed and temperature. And there it is. <clears throat> if the temperature of a gas increases, its average kinetic energy increases, more molecules have higher speeds and fewer molecules have lower speeds and the distribution shifts towards higher speeds overall, that is, to the right. If temperature decreases, the average kinetic energy decreases. More molecules have lower speeds, and fewer molecules have higher speeds, and the distribution shifts toward lower speeds overall, that is, to the left. This behavior is illustrated for nitrogen gas in figure 933. At a given temperature, all gases have the same average kinetic energy for their molecules. Gases composed of lighter molecules have more high-speed particles and have a higher URMS, with a speed distribution that peaks at relatively higher speeds. Gases consisting of heavier molecules have more low-speed particles, a lower URMS, and a speed distribution that peaks at relatively lower speeds. This trend is demonstrated by the data for a series of noble gases shown in figure 934. The kinetic molecular theory explains the behavior of gases part two. According to Graham's law, the molecules of a gas are in rapid motion and the molecules themselves are small. 
The average distance between the molecules of a gas is large compared to the size of the molecules. As a consequence, gas molecules can move past each other easily and diffuse at relatively fast rates. The rate of effusion of a gas depends directly on the average speed of its molecules. Effusion rate, um, proportional to URMS, using this relation and the equation relating molecular speed to mass, Graham's law may be easily derived as shown here. And then there's the equation. Their ratio of rates of effusion is thus derived to be inversely proportional to the ratio of the square roots of their masses. This is the same observ or relation observed experimentally and expressed as Graham's law. 9.6. Non-ideal gas behavior. By the end of this section, you will be able to describe the physical factors that lead to deviations from ideal gas behavior. Explain how these factors are represented in the van der Waals equation. Define compressibility, Z, and describe how its variation with pressure uh, reflects non-ideal behavior. Quantify non-ideal behavior by comparing computations of gas properties using the ideal gas law and the van der Waals equation. Thus far, the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, has been applied to a variety of different types of problems, ranging from reaction stoichiometry and empirical and molecular formula problems to determining the density and molar mass of a gas. As mentioned in the previous modules of this chapter, however, the behavior of a gas is often non-ideal, meaning that the observed relationships between its pressure, volume, and temperature are not accurately described by the gas laws. In this section, the reason for these deviations from ideal gas behavior are considered. One way in which the accuracy of PV equals NRT can be judged is by comparing the actual volume of one mole of gas to the molar volume of an ideal gas at the same temperature and pressure. This ratio is called the compressibility factor with that equaling stuff. Ideal gas behavior is therefore indicated when this ratio is equal to one. And any deviation from one is an indication from non-ideal behavior. Figure 935 shows plots of Z over large pressures, uh, large, over a large pressure range for several common gases. As is apparent from figure 935, the ideal gas law does not describe gas behavior well at relatively high pressures. To determine why this is, Consider the differences between real gas properties and what is expected of a hypothetical ideal gas. Particles of a hypothetical ideal gas have no significant volume and do not attract or repel each other. In general, real gases approximate this behavior at relatively low pressures and high temperatures. However, at high pressures, the molecules of a gas are crowded closer together and the amount of empty space between the molecules is reduced. At these higher pressures, the volume of the gas molecules themselves becomes appreciable relative to the total volume occupied by the gas. The gas therefore becomes less compressible at these high pressures, and although its volume continues to decrease with, its increasing, with increasing pressure, this decrease is not proportional as predicted by Boyle's law. At relatively low pressures, gas molecules have practically no attraction for one another because they are, on average, so far apart, and they, ha they behave almost like particles of an ideal gas. At higher pressures, however, the force of attraction is also no longer insignificant. This force pulls the molecules a little closer together, slightly decreasing the pressure if the volume is constant or decreasing the volume at constant pressure. <sighs> this change is more pronounced at lower, low temperatures because the molecules have lower kinetic energy relative to the attractive forces, so they are less effective in overcoming these attractin attractions after colliding with one another. You know, um, there are several different equations that better approximate gas behavior uh, than does the ideal gas law. The first and simplest of these was developed by the Dutch scientist Johannes van der Waals in 1879. The van der Waals equation improves upon the ideal gas law by adding two terms, one to account for the volume of the gas molecules and another for the attractive forces between them. The constant A corresponds to the strength of the attraction between molecules of a particular gas and the constant B corresponds to the size of the molecules of a particular gas. The correction to the pressure term in the ideal gas law is 
n squared a over v squared, and the correction to the volume is nv. Note that when v is relatively large and n is relatively small, both of these correction terms become negligible, and van der Waals equation reduces to the ideal gas law. Such a condition corresponds to a gas in which a relatively low number of molecules is occupying a relatively large volume, that is, a gas at a relatively low pressure. Experimental values for the van der Waals constants of some common gases are given table 9.3. At low pressures, the correction for intermolecular attraction, A, is more important than the one for molecular volume, B. At high pressures and small volumes, the correction for the volume of the molecules becomes important because the mo molecules themselves are incompressible and constitute an appreciable fraction of the total volume. At some intermediate pressure, the two corrections have opposing influences, and the gas appears to follow the relationship given by PV equals NRT over a small range of pressures. This behavior is reflected by the dips in several of the compressibility curves shown in figure 935. The attractive force between molecules initially makes the gas more compressible than an ideal gas. As pressure is raised, Z decreases with increasing P at very high pressures. The gas becomes less compressible, Z increases with P, as the molecules begin to occupy an increasingly significant fraction of the total gas volume. Strictly speaking, the ideal gas equation functions well when... <clears throat> Intermolecular attractions between gas molecules are negligible, and the gas molecules themselves do not occupy an appreciable part of the whole volume. These criteria are satisfied under conditions of low pressure and high temperature. Under such conditions, the gas is said to behave ideally, and deviations from the gas law are small enough that they may be disregarded. This is, however, very often not the case. All right, and that's it. Chapter 9.